So one of the things that I did want to make clear with my class is I know that I'm going to be using the First Amendment, but everything that I'm showing you today, you can just take the Fourth Amendment, some of the terminology, the, you know, the issues, the wording, and just kind of plug it into what I've done today into the case law databases or any of the secondary sources um, that you're going to be using for this assignment. So in this class, I kind of want to start at the end. And so I'm going to show you a tool that we have on Westlaw that's going to help you with one of the most important parts of the appellate brief writing process, and that is the table of authorities. So I'm going to pull down on the top left where it says Westlaw Precision, and I'm going to go to where it says Drafting Assistant. So one of the toughest parts of the brief writing process is creating your table of contents. So you might be thinking, Anna, that doesn't sound really difficult because it's just essentially a list of um, the cases, the documents that I've cited to in my appellate brief, and I'm just making kind of a table of authorities listing with the page number. Well, I'm gonna pose a question and you can answer in chat if you want to, you don't have to, no judgment here. Um, but how many of you actually finished any of your assignments last semester, maybe a full week ahead of time, or maybe three or four days ahead of time? Or were you the kind of student that was working on it the night before or even the morning of? And so that becomes a real issue with the appellate brief and the table of authorities, because any substantive or any even minor change to your brief can possibly repaginate it either forward or backward, depending if you're adding or deleting text. So I have clicked into Drafting Assistant and I am going to upload this brief that I have. And so here we have the brief that I've added from my desktop, and I'm going to click on the left where it says TOA Builder. And you will want to create a profile, and I'm going to go ahead and just show you that to create new. You can select your jurisdiction if that's important to your research the content of the different types of documents that you've cited to so that it'll create headers for each of those, the font, the size of your font, um, and then any other formatting that you need, as well as if you want it double space, single space, the kind of tab leader that you want. Um, since I already have one, I will just click cancel and I'm gonna click run. So this is going to pull out all of the citations that I have in this brief that I've uploaded. And I have this brief for a specific couple of reasons that I wanna highlight once the builder has completed running. So here are all of the citations and I'm gonna click insert over on the bottom left. It will ask me where do I want this to appear? And so I'll just do it right at the top and click submit. And so here is my new table of authorities that I just created. I would click finish. And then now I can download my new Word document over on the bottom left. Now, I always say use this as a supplement, not as a complete substitute for doing your table of authorities for just a couple of reasons. One, just because you wanna go back and double check and make sure that the pages are right. Um, to see. Um, but I also wanted to highlight in places where maybe the drafting assistant didn't pick up a page, maybe there were a couple of extra spaces, maybe I forgot the pages, um, maybe it doesn't have the full case name, um, or all of the, you know, the court and the date, I can see here that I'm missing the title and the US code part of the citation and the date. So I might need to go back. But I can tell you from my own personal experience back 
in the mid 90s when I was in law school, creating the table of authorities probably took me alone a full day and a half or so because I kept having to go back and check and make sure that my pages were right. And if I thought about changing something, I knew that would change possibly all of my pages. So having something like this as part of your toolkit can save you an astronomical amount of time so that you can spend that on editing and making sure that everything is right in the text of your actual brief and not spending it on this part that is important, of course, but it can be a challenge to do um, if you wait until the very end. So again, use it as a supplement, not as a total substitute. I can see and go through and now easily go back to page 18, 22 to make sure that these are the correct places where this case is and make any quick little changes if I wanted to. So I wanted to highlight drafting assistant essentials just in case um, you would want to consider using this. I really wish this would have been available when I was a law student many moons ago. All right, so I'm going back to Westlaw Precision and I want to start with some case law searching. Now, I know that you can always start right here on the homepage in the global toolbar and run my search. I can select the jurisdiction where I wanna run the primary law, but there are a couple of things that I wanna show you that only appear when you were in an actual database that I wanted to highlight today. So I'm gonna go ahead and click into content types and I wanna click into cases. For the purposes of this class, I am going to select all federal. I don't know what actual jurisdiction y'all are researching in. So just to show you some examples of how to narrow up and tweak your searching, I am going to use all feds. But if you are using the Supreme Court or a specific circuit, go into that smaller database. I'm a big believer in going to where you know your answer is or should be. Um, I'm probably going to get quite a few results here, more than I could probably go through. And again, it's really just to show you an example of how to narrow up your searches. And so the thing that I wanted to focus, focus on in case law today is how to start with a broad search and then narrow it up to something more specific, as well as using some additional tools that we also have specifically for case law searching. Um, I want to go ahead and click on advanced over on the far right of the screen. So here we have a listing of all of our connectors and expanders. I'm also a big believer in just throwing a search out there just to start and see what you get. But if you're getting too many, you may need to connect and expand your search terms um, just with the terminology or connect the relationship. Um, just simply because when you're searching something like the Constitution, the amendments, search terms that appear a lot, you have to find a way to try to narrow them up and make them related in some way. So I'm going to go back just real quick and start with a really simple, basic search. So I'm using the First Amendment. And I'm looking for cases dealing with school and student speech. I maybe have a couple of other issues, um, maybe that there was a student who posted something either on, you know, their Facebook page or posted something on um, Instagram about a principal or a teacher, and it wasn't very flattering, and they got in trouble with the school and the school district or um, something like that. So, I have a lot of terms there that I could potentially enter in, school, student, speech, um, social media, online, internet, principal, maybe administration. I'm brainstorming here because I think that's also a big part of the research process is thinking of all the different possible terms and terminology that you could throw into the search. And so I do want to start simple, though. I don't want to throw everything in there because maybe I don't know a lot about con law yet or the First Amendment specifically. So I just want to see what's out there. I am likely going to get quite a few materials because I'm in all federal cases. 
but I want to show you how you can narrow things up. And so I've retrieved over 9,000, 9,012 cases. Again, quite a bit since I am in all feds. Maybe if I was just in the Supreme Court or maybe the Fifth Circuit or First Circuit, whatever circuit I might be researching in, I likely wouldn't have gotten that many. But still, I just wanted to highlight this for you. You can see where your search terms appear highlighted in yellow and in bold throughout the text of this um, the results. So that's helpful. Remember over on the left side of the screen, you can do a search within results, searching for something else to appear in the 9,000 documents so that it'll make your list smaller. So maybe I wanna add in social media. Maybe that's the real critical um, part of my research is that it was online. Um, it wasn't at school. It wasn't, you know, in my locker or I wasn't protesting on the campus. It was social media. It was maybe my personal Facebook page. And it dropped my list now down to 350, which is definitely getting in the manageable range. I could probably scan through maybe the first 20, the first 40 or so, maybe restrict by date. Um, something else that I might be looking for throughout the text of these cases. So I did want to highlight that, that starting with a really simple search and then doing a search within results is oftentimes a really good way to begin. Um, don't narrow it up too much from the first search. I mean, if you're trying to find that perfect case, that's fine, but always know that you might need to go back and, and try something else, you know, educator, teacher, um, again, you know, maybe the specific type of um, social media, if it was online, maybe a blog or, you know, something like that. So again, just different ways to look through your searches. So I'm going to go back to federal cases and I'm going to delete this search and I'm going to click back on advanced. So I want to talk about the connectors first, really mainly the connectors. So you can see that we have them listed out and how you would use them, such as the ampersand within the same sentence, an or, um, if you're looking for synonyms, student, teacher, principal, things like that, um, different types of people at the school um, within the same paragraph. Um, if you were looking for a phrase exactly, such as social media, um, that I, you know, used in my search within. So if you were looking for an exact phrase to appear, you could use that. Um, a space, again, is an or, just like actually typing the word or out. Um, and then you have your numerical connectors where N would be substituted with a number. And so I want to highlight a couple of different options that you could try, um, again, with the different terms that are as part of your assignments but keeping with somewhat the same search that I just ran. So I'm gonna do school and student within the same paragraph as speech. I did want to talk about the order. So first quotations will always connect first. So Westlaw is going to look for anything in quotes first. It will then look for any numerical connector, any number if I had within five of speech or within 10 of speech, it would look for student within 10 of speech if I had that as a number. It will then look for grammar. So it is now going to look for student within the same paragraph as speech. And then finally, the ampersand is last and school. So this is going to look for anything in all feds dealing with student within the same paragraph as speech and school. So student and speech have to be in the same paragraph and it also has to have the word school. And again, I, I'm using school, which is pretty broad in and of itself. I mean, you could say college, university, um, educational institution, wherever it might be. And so it did drop that list because I did tighten it up just a little bit. 
um, to about 7,700 plus documents. So it dropped it down by about 2,300 documents or so, a little bit better. Again, I'm in all feds. So, you know, I have, you know, retrieved quite a few. If Again, I was in just Supreme Court or in, you know, just a circuit, I likely wouldn't have retrieved as many, but I did just want to show you how you can tighten it up. I could tighten it up even more by changing that ampersand to within the same paragraph saying they all have to be in the same paragraph together somewhere. I know that this is a big topic, a big thing. So I want to find where a court has really discussed these issues intensely, where all of these words appear in at least the same paragraph together. You could tighten it even more by saying within the same sentence or within you know five words of one another. And you can see how I keep going down just a little bit each time. Again, I can do my search within results, add something here, principal, blog, social media, poster, protesting, whatever your issues are, you can do that now within the search within results from the more specific search that you've been doing. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete that and I'm gonna go back to my federal cases. And I wanna show you another way to search besides just your plain natural language you can connect your terms, trying different connectors to see how they work for you. And again, I think that's also really important that, that you know of different options because we all think differently. I may be researching the social media issue. You might be researching, you know, exactly what was said in the post or, you know, online. So I want to show you another way. I'm going to click again where it says advanced. And I'm going to pop open this PDF of a case that appears here to talk about what I'm getting ready to show you. So every document on Westlaw can be broken down into parts called fields. And I can tell Westlaw exactly where in the document I want my search terms to appear. So I know you all know what a case looks like. So you have things like your citation, the party names, the docket numbers, the dates that it was argued and decided. You then have what's called the synopsis, which is written by the West editors, which is just a quick summary of the case, including some of the facts, the procedural history, and the holding. You then have what's called the digest, which includes your headnotes, as well as your West topic and key numbers. These are also written by the West editors that are telling me point by point in order of the opinion, the legal issues that were argued and discussed in the case. Why is this important? This is important because the West editors do a lot of work for us and are essentially telling us, Anna or you, this is what happened in the case. These were all of the issues that were argued. Furthermore, they tend to use more common legal jargon than sometimes a court will. Um, so it gives you a little bit of flexibility in the search terms that you also choose to use because maybe the court used a more formal language. So for example, you know, maybe he called him the optometrist and your search term was the doctor or the physician. So um, utilizing these parts can be really helpful, but also because you will know that these were critical issues in the case versus whether they just appeared in passing. So I want to show you how to use them. So I'm back to my search when I clicked on advanced and as I scroll down on the screen, you can see all of those different parts in little template forms here. And one of them is the synopsis and digest field. So it's going to search in that top first paragraph and in your headnotes and key numbers. 
So that's not going to search in the opinion. So I want to I'll highlight that when I get to a result. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rely on the West editors. I'm going to trust them and their experience in reading and editing the cases to find those real kind of nuggets that are out there that really discuss my school student and speech issue. So I'm going to type in my synopsis and digest school within the same paragraph as student, within the same paragraph as speech. So all in that same little head note, um, not head note, um, that synopsis or even in the head note, yes. And so I'm gonna click search. So I'm not searching in the opinion. Uh, I'm not looking there right now. I'm gonna look at just the synopsis and just the head notes. And so now it dropped my list to 1,472 versus when I started at the very beginning, I was over 9,000 with my basic simple search. But now I have 1,400 where school is within the same paragraph as student, that's in the same paragraph as speech, somewhere in the synopsis or in the digest part of the case. So I'm gonna open up Morse v. Frederick. Don't forget when you have just one case that you want to start with, that you can look at the table of authorities. You can also look at key site citing references. So if you find one good case, that's an easy way to expand your research. So don't forget about those options. But I want to go ahead and use my browse to hop into. So here we have in my synopsis, a high school student. Um, and then speech, here they all are in that paragraph. Here we have our head notes. I can see if they're somewhere in my head notes. So here we are as well. Don't forget about your West topic and key numbers. And so if you like this particular head note, I would maybe want to click on the constitutional law number 92, key number 1975 for con law student speech or conduct. And that would run a search for me looking for additional cases that also have that same issue that was argued and discussed. But if I click on this headnote number and it takes me to the opinion, I did want to note that none of my search terms appear highlighted within the opinion because I didn't tell Westlaw to look there. I was only highlighting cases where my school, student, speech, all within the same paragraph appeared in the synopsis or in the digest, the headnotes or the key number. So I did want to make that point because sometimes students are like, well, why don't my search terms appear highlighted in the opinion? I was telling Westlaw to just look in the synopsis or in the digest. So I did want to point that out. All right, so I hope you consider using the side die option. I think it's a really great tool to use, particularly when you are researching something like the constitution that can bring thousands and thousands of results up because those terms appear in so many documents in so many different ways. It really helps narrow that up. And now if I go back to my list, you know, maybe I, you know, also want to do, you know, my search within results here. Again, I still don't want to fill up my, you know, search box within my synopsis and digest field up too, too much. Um, just simply because, you know, you can see the synopsis isn't very long. It's only about a, you know, few sentences, maybe a paragraph at best. So don't feel like you need to include everything. You can see how I've kept my search to pretty much my, you know, original search terms, but I've just changed the relationship between the words and utilized those fields as well. All right, I'm going to go back to my federal cases search again and go back to advanced. And I'm gonna go almost to the very bottom of the fields. Now this field that I'm gonna show you in this class today is actually based on a volume of books. Um, 
I really challenge you to go and visit the uh, reference desk and ask to see these in print. I'm pretty sure that they're in print in the library at, at, at Arkansas. So words and phrases is a volume of books that if you're looking for a word or a phrase, will show you cases that have defined what that word or phrase means in that jurisdiction. And so it's not like per se, like Black's Law Dictionary that tells me what mens rea means. It gives me a definition by a court's opinion. And so what I love about this is a lot of times you're trying to get a court opinion to say something is or isn't something. And words and phrases does that for you. It's based on that volume of books. And because we publish it, we can have it here as a searchable feature. Now, this will definitely be a time that you keep it to just one word or just one phrase. So I want to see how courts have defined what speech is. Does it have to be a protest on a sidewalk? Does it have to include a picket sign, a poster? Does it have to be written in a newspaper in print? Does a blog count? Does a social media Facebook post count? Does an X threads count or Instagram or a Snapchat? I don't know. How has a court defined that? I need to find that definition. So I'm telling Westlaw, I want you to use those words and phrases books to find those cases that have told me what speech is. Now this list I can tell you will almost always be really small. It's pretty big here, 494 results, because again, we are in all feds. But if I was just in the Supreme Court or maybe just the Fifth Circuit or Ninth Circuit or a state case law database, it might only be a handful or a dozen. It is strictly based on those volumes of books. It's why I, I challenge you to go and find them in the library, um, just so that you can get a visual of what it's what it looks like. So if there's something you do this week or next week, once the weather is better, um, go in and ask the reference desk, like, do we have the words and phrases books? And can you tell me where they are so I can take a look? I promise you, they will be one of the best tools that you can use. So if I hop into Jordan v. Jewell, just as an example, I want to show you to show you what a result looks like here. So I can go and see. So commercial speech for First Amendment purposes is speech that proposes a commercial transaction. And so you can see here and I can see the discussion in the opinion that talks about whether or not speech falls in commercial or non-commercial. But, you know, obviously this might not be what I'm actually looking for. So I can narrow it up. I can do that again, where maybe I'm looking for things that talk about social media and speech. So let's see if the 494 are narrowed down to something maybe a little bit more specific in my case, and it did, it dropped it down to 25 results. Definitely much more manageable here. Post on social media, touting their products. Um, here we have government speech versus private speech. Again, you can see now where my social media appears highlighted in the text, in addition to my words and phrases, search looking for definitions of the word speech. So I hope that these were helpful in just giving you new ways of thinking about searching in case law, mixing things up. You know, again, I'm a big believer in starting broad just to see what's out there. You can see just kind of the evolution of my different searches here. Um, you know, I just started broad. I tightened it up just a little bit. I tightened it up even a little bit more. I could have tightened it up even better by, you know, maybe making those sentence connectors instead of paragraph. And then I use those two field searches to really hone in on tight discussions of my issue. The side die, the editors read the case and have said, Anna, this is what these cases are about. These were the critical issues. This case really discussed student speech in schools 
you might want to take a look at these. And then the words and phrases option looks for judicial definitions of a word or a phrase. So a word, just a singular word or a phrase in quotes. So you can try any of those. All right, I'm gonna go back to the homepage. And I'm gonna go back to content types and click into your statutes and court rules. And I'm gonna hop into the constitution. And I like showing you this. Um, I know that you know that you can go to the Constitution as a place to begin, but I did want to highlight something that happens with your constitutional amendments that looks kind of a little confusing sometimes. So I'm going to click into the First Amendment. And when I do that, it looks like there are about seven First Amendment. So you might be thinking to yourself, why are there seven of these? And that is because there are so many notes of decisions attached to the First Amendment. There are so many documents that have cited to this. We've had to break it up by sub issues. And so I know that you're going to be dealing with an amendment. And so if you go to the amendment that you're using, you may have to take just a minute or so to go through the notes of decisions. So I can see that there are subdivisions one to six, seven to 18, and so on. I think my Roman numerals are correct there. So if I click into this, this one with the first set of subdivisions of the notes of decisions, I can see here, if I go into this first set, I can look through all of the different types of subjects that are covered by the cases that cited to this. So, well, persons protected, protected speech or activities, those look intriguing to me. So here we have attorneys, cable television people, children, parolees, prisoners, miscellaneous persons. Not sure here, maybe I wanna look at children, not sure. If I go into protected speech or activities, that might be where I want to go. Public concern, private speech, conduct, panhandling. And again, I can just go through all of these subjects to see if there are any that might be related to what I'm doing. And so I just wanted to show you that it may take you a little bit of time to go through the notes of decisions if you at least want to look at your constitutional amendment to get started. It is a way to get started, um, but it can take a little bit of time because there are so many documents that have cited to every amendment in the constitution. But if I just go to the next group, you know, here we are seven to 18. I can look at these notes of decisions categories, just take a couple of seconds here. Again, see if any of these might be related to what I'm looking for. You know, here we have retaliation, restraint, justification, you know, nothing that looks super relevant to what I'm doing. So I can go through that section just real quick, maybe take one more click or two just to see the other couple of sections to make sure I'm not missing something helpful in the notes of decisions. Again, the notes of decisions are written by the West editors. They've read these cases and have said, Anna, if you're researching the First Amendment or whatever amendment that you're looking at, these cases have really discussed it, but this is how they've discussed it. So again, they're saving you a little bit of time. So here I have maybe defamation, libel, or slander. Maybe that was my issue with the student. Maybe he talked really poorly about the principal or a teacher, perhaps, and they are just, you know, trying to ban this student, you know, get him reported him on Facebook or whatever it might be. And then here's my final click. And I can look through these categories to see what else might be important. And Jackpot, here we are. So I did need to click, and that is what I really wanted to highlight. It might not be in the first group, but you might have to get through a couple of the groups and just not miss it. Here we have 
teachers, students, schools, universities, miscellaneous speech or activities. And if I start clicking and opening these categories, I can see all of the different subcategories. And so here we have high schools, colleges, university, the regulation, content. And so now I can click on any of these and it will link me to cases that have discussed that particular sub issue in relation to the First Amendment. And so I did want to highlight the Constitution as a place to also get started. It may also lead you to some additional topic and key numbers. So when you start seeing those topic and key numbers, you might think to yourself, well, I'm looking here, you know, this is from New York, Supreme Court. You know, maybe I'm Louisiana, we're not using Supreme Court, this is Connecticut, but I could use this topic and key number 2005 or 1448 to maybe expand and find some Fifth Circuit or Louisiana federal cases that might be helpful for me. So even if you're looking through the notes of decisions and maybe it doesn't look like it's it's helpful for you because it's not in the right jurisdiction, click on the topic and key number and then change the jurisdiction to your jurisdiction. So if I click on this 2005, you know, maybe I don't want, you know, the Supreme Court. Maybe I want to change it to Fifth Circuit, perhaps, or Louisiana or Arkansas, whatever jurisdiction I'm researching in. So again, just another way to get started to try to find cases that are a little bit more organized. One other reason I like that is it's just giving me new terminology. I'm researching school and wow, here's post-secondary institutions. Maybe that's a phrase that I need to look for, university, colleges. Um, vocational schools, whatever it might be. All right, I'm going to go back to the home page and go back into content types for one last type of document. And then I want to show you one more feature and tool that I think will be really helpful for you. I want to click back into secondary sources or into secondary sources. And I want to scroll through um, the types and by state um, and highlight by topic, because we do have um, secondary sources organized by constitutional law. So if you did want to start with a secondary source, that is an option. I do um, know that your professors really want you to focus in on cases and honing in your research skills. So try a couple of those um, options that I showed you at the beginning with our cases, including the fields and the connectors. But if you do want to get some background information, consider using a secondary source as just a jumping off point as well, just to learn the terminology that you might need. Um, it might lead you to some case law, but you definitely want to look at case law. And just like our notes of decisions and all of those subsections of the First Amendment, I might want to take a little bit of time to look through the list of secondary sources. You know, is there something specific on the First Amendment or speech, something I want to look for? So here we have a whole treatise on the First Amendment, a law review on the First Amendment. I can just take a few minutes to teach myself and see what might be here that I didn't know was on Westlaw before. So Again, plan out your research. Today, I want to focus on cases. Tomorrow, I'm going to look at some of the notes of decision cases that are appearing. Maybe today, I want to look at a couple of secondary sources, modern constitutional law. So that might be something current. You know, maybe I don't want to look at stuff from, you know, 50, 70 years ago. Maybe I want to look at some new discussion. Here we have so here we have Rotunda and Nowak's Treatise on Constitutional Law. If y'all are taking con law this semester, that's great for that class, but also perhaps this assignment. Um, so here we have some other databases. I can go through and see if there's anything on speech perhaps, and just kind of look through anything. Here we have Smala and Nimmer on freedom of speech. So that might be a secondary source that I would want to take a look at. I could hop in there just to see um, what appears and just see if there's anything that might be helpful here. And here we have government as educator. That might be helpful for me. 
again, hate speech, anything, public forum, vagueness, anything that I would want to, you know, kind of take a look at and see if there's anything that might be helpful for me. Can I ask a so, quick question? Sure. How did you get from the secondary sources to the filtered secondary sources again? Yep. So I went to content types from the homepage and then I went to secondary and then I scrolled down and it's under by topic and it's over on the left side where it says constitutional law. Thank you. You're welcome. So again, I know your professors really want you to focus a lot and honing your skills on trying different searches in case law, but you know, again, if you're struggling for terminology, just a basic understanding of the law, looking at a secondary source is a good place to start as well. And so, you know, just take a look. I'm just going to hop back in Smala. Um, why not take a look and see? I'm going to go back into my chapter 17. And here we have school sponsored activities at high schools, elementary schools, censorship of school newspapers. So, you know, it's only five pages, so it's probably not gonna give me a massive amount of materials, but it might lead me to one or two good cases, but it might also lead me to just, again, some good terminology that I can take into my case law. Maybe I'm just focused on the social media aspect of my hypothetical, but there might be a really good case about a blog or, you know, a pamphlet or a newsletter, something I hadn't really considered. So again, trying different databases to me also just makes you stronger in the research, but also in the writing process, because you have a really good breadth of information and knowledge from all the different sources that you're looking at and not just in one place and one type of search. All right, I'm gonna go back to the homepage and I wanna show you another tool that we have. I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom, almost to the very bottom um, and it's to the left and it's the feature called Quick Check. Quick, quick. <laughs> Quick Check is a tool that you can use to look through a document that you're working on, and it will pull up recommendations based on the document that you've had go through Westlaw. And so I'm work. So this might be something really good about midway through your writing process. Um, if you feel like you have a part of your document that you might need just a little bit more of information. I'm gonna pull up on my desktop that sample brief. So it might take me a minute here just to run through because it's about a 20 page document. But if you feel like you're missing something or you have some gaps in your research and you feel like I need just a little something else, maybe just one or two more cases to make my point here, you can run your brief through Quick Check and it's gonna run through Westlaw looking for documents that might be related to the research that you were um, doing. Um, just a couple of things about Quick Check. We don't keep your document. In fact, one of the last messages on this pop-up will say that we're deleting it from our system. So we don't keep it, we don't store it. Um, and it's also recommending things that you don't have in your document. So a question that I get a lot of times is, well, why didn't Westlaw recommend these documents when I was doing my search? And it might be, you might've actually looked at the documents, but we're just recommending things that you haven't already cited to. So just allowing you just new information, maybe new information that you haven't really considered, or also just double checking yourself and going, let me look at that case again. You know, I didn't think it was good, but maybe I want to revisit it. Westlaw quick check, you know, thought it might be related. So again, we don't know what your research assignment is. We are just basing our suggestions, our recommendations based on the text, the citations and things you have in your document. So it does take us a few minutes or so, depending on um, you know how big the document that you're uploading is. Um, and so just give us a second here. Hopefully it'll be done in just a second.
And as I've mentioned, I am recording this. And so I will send this link to your professors and they will post it online. You can also see my email up at the top of the screen, anna.gara at tr.com. So if you are researching and you do have questions, please don't ever hesitate to email me. Pending weather, um, this is really my busy training time. Um, I do travel to several schools. I'm often in classes. So um, if you do get my out of office, just please be patient. Um, I don't really take any vacation until April. So it's just a matter of me getting back to my computer. All right, so our report is compiling. So it's deleting my brief that I uploaded. So it's not keeping it. And here is my report. And so here I can see that Westlaw has recommended 68 cases, 10 briefs and memoranda, some additional secondary sources. And so in total, there are 100 recommendations. So I can see any of those documents just by clicking on the content over on the left side. But one of the things that I love about doing this kind of midway through my brief writing process and already organizing things by headers is that Westlaw will do the recommendations based on the headers that I actually also have in this document that I uploaded. So if I know that I'm struggling in a particular section, uh, maybe in section 4B, I can go in and look at those specific five documents that Westlaw has recommended for that particular part about past persecution. So. Um, I don't have to look at all 68 of these if I know that I'm just looking for, you know, one part of my brief. It will also key cite all of your documents for you, just letting you know if it has a red flag, a yellow flag. Um, it will let you know if it's a 10 year plus case that you have cited to. It's um, this brief is from the early 2000s. So I know that Immigration's law has changed, so this is just my sample for this class. So it's telling me that, you know, maybe I want to take a look at another case here. It will also check my quotes. So this is also important um, for the end of your brief writing process. It'll check from your document to the document on Westlaw. Um, so you definitely don't want to miss, um, you know, attribute some sort of text um, here I can see that it's different. I, you know, this document has an ellipsis versus this full part that I've cut out of the text of the U.S. code here, as well as listing all of the documents that I have cited to in this brief um, that I have uploaded. So again, just another tool, maybe in the early writing process, midway through, um, you know, 75% through, if you're thinking, maybe I just need something else, one last check, maybe let me quote check my document, let me check everything I've cited to for Keysight and make sure it's all still good before I turn this in. So those were the things that I wanted to highlight today for you. I am going to stop the recording.